I'm uh, presenting to you tonight from the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and we also give great thanks to them for sharing this territory uh, that our uh, office is located on. It's the center of our political work. Uh, the title of the event tonight is Unity of Indigenous and Non-Indigenous Workers in the Struggle for Revolutionary Change. And that's a, a title, a theme that we picked because we wanted to, to put this in uh, the most positive way possible. There are some controversial subjects in the course of this discussion, but we, uh, we put the emphasis that way. Uh, just introducing myself briefly, for those who don't know me, I was born on Treaty 6 territory in Saskatoon. Uh, my family background includes both European immigrants and Métis people on the southern prairies. I joined the Communist Party in 1972 and I've been a member of our central executive since 1993. Uh, Tyson and I are both going to talk about 15 to 20 minutes tonight. Uh, so as I said, I'm first. This is a, a huge subject and we could all benefit from more reading and study and practical activity. Uh, specifically, I wanna to talk tonight about two aspects of this theme. Uh, one will be the debate around terminology, such as the concept of settler colonialism. Uh, but first, I think it would be useful to explore some of the history and role of the Communist Party. Now, our party's revolutionary outlook and organizational principles make us unique among Canadian political parties. We're not a party of any one particular section of society. Uh, we bring together Indigenous and non-Indigenous workers in the struggle for socialism. Uh, workers of all lands unite, as Marx and Engels said, uh, which is not an abstract slogan. Uh, we put great emphasis on what we call the national question, the struggle for liberation of nations and peoples oppressed by a dominant imperialist power, whether that's within the boundaries of a particular territorial state or on a wider global scale. Marx and Engels regarded the resistance of occupied and oppressed peoples as a key factor in the historical struggle to end the barbaric system of capitalist exploitation. They were strong supporters of anti-imperialist fighters in India, Ireland, and many other countries, and they criticized socialists who denied the importance of these struggles. Lenin had a similar approach when he uh, was responding to dogmatists who scoffed at the Easter rising in Ireland as nationalism. He criticized those who imagine that social revolution is conceivable without revolts by small nations in the colonies and in Europe. Some of the people from those countries chose to look for a better life here. The most early members of the Communist Party were working class migrants forced by poverty or repression to seek a better future here on Turtle Island, as uh, North America is known. Uh, these included thousands, for example, of ethnic Finns and Russians who left Tsarist Russia, which was called the Prison House of Nations. Other immigrants were, you know, Scots or Irish origin, for example, or from China or the Punjab region of India. And they shared a common negative experience uh, of imperialism. Some of them were inclined towards sympathy with the indigenous peoples who they discovered uh, had their land stolen to allow for the expansion of capitalist profiteering on a vast scale on this continent, including the exploitation of migrant laborers. So as capitalist expansion continued in, uh, in Canada in the 1800s, there were even some settler immigrants who consciously allied themselves with indigenous groups and communities who resisted this process. The most notable uh, were probably the settler neighbors who supported the Métis resistance struggles led by Louis Riel in 1870 and again in 1885. Uh, they may have been small in numbers, but they grasped that unity was needed uh, against the big railroad and banking and agricultural monopolies which were exerting their power across the West. On the other hand, unfortunately, many socialists and white trade unionists took part in shameful acts 
such as the 1907 anti-Asian riots, in the mistaken belief that non-white workers were responsible for driving down wages, not the capitalist class. The ideological problem here is the racist myth that Canada was a white man's country. The communists of the 1920s rejected this racism. They acted instead on proletarian principles. An injury to one is an injury to all. Workers of all lands unite. This was qualitatively different from earlier socialist organizations, which to one degree or another had suffered from elements of chauvinism and white supremacy. This understanding was the source of Tim Buck's famous quote uh, at the 1931 trial of communist leaders on charges of sedition. He said that the bourgeois state was formed in Canada first to enforce the robber's will on the suppressed Indians and later on the working class. Tim Buck and his comrades understood that the oppression of indigenous peoples was part of the overall capitalist drive to divide workers and to exploit labor and natural resources. The extreme poverty forced on indigenous peoples was seen as a way for employers to expand the reserve army of the unemployed, but also as a moral outrage inflicted on the victims of imperialist colonization. The communists spoke out frequently against the oppression of indigenous communities, including the outrages in the so-called residential schools, some of the earliest uh, 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 revelations of that abuse were in our press. The pages of communist newspapers from the 1920s and onward include many reports of the conditions faced by indigenous peoples and expressing solidarity with their protests. On the theoretical level, the early study of the national question was mainly focused on the unequal union of English speaking Canada and Quebec, to use the title of Stanley Ryerson's famous book. Ryerson also helped build a broader Marxist understanding of the dispossession and oppression of indigenous peoples, that this was not a so-called dark chapter in our history, but rather it was a crucial stage in the formation of the Canadian capitalist state, baked right into the, the nature of this state. Ryerson was the first Canadian Marxist to begin serious studies of how European colonial powers and later the new Canadian state conducted a centuries long strategy of genocide and cultural assimila assimilation. His groundbreaking book, The Founding of Canada, beginnings to 1815, was published in 1960, but his research had already informed our party's expanding positions on the national question, both in regards to Quebec and indigenous peoples. And on an ironic note, of course, Stanley was a descendant of Edgerton Ryerson, who played a big role in establishing the residential school system. And uh, there were apparently communists involved in toppling Edgerton Ryerson's statue at Ryerson University recently. So good on them. Uh, the decades which followed the passage of the Indian Act in 1876 and the defeat at Batash were marked by apartheid style policies, uh, which saw severe limits on the ability of indigenous Métis communities to organize. These years saw the bans against the potlatch and the Sundance ceremonies, the elimination of traditional governance systems, the exclusion of women from band councils, expansion of the residential schools, which aimed to destroy indigenous languages and cultures, laws forbidding public meetings or hiring lawyers or traveling off the reserve without the permission of Indian agents. But by the 1920s, indigenous peoples were openly defying the Indian Act and finding ways to organize resistance. Growing numbers uh, of indigenous and Métis workers entered the workforce, especially in the resource sector. Uh, they became increasingly proletarianized, uh, made more contacts with radical minded workers, including communists. This uh, was a notable trend among Métis people who'd been deprived of any land base of their own. Uh, there were also large numbers of working class indigenous people on the West Coast. Uh, Rolf Knight's book, Indians at Work, is the pioneering study of indigenous labor here. Uh, looking at workers in the, uh, the forestry, fish canneries, the waterfront, and so forth. And some began to join the Communist Party during the, uh, the Great Depression, particularly. The most famous were Jim Brady and Malcolm Norris, uh, 
who were two of the initial founders of the Métis Association of Alberta. Brady and Norris helped to lead a campaign during the 1930s to force the Alberta government to establish Métis settlements. This was the first successful effort to establish a Métis land base on the prairies. Brady remained an active communist in northern Saskatchewan until his mysterious disappearing on a prospecting trip in 1967. Uh, I'm going to try and share the screen here for a few moments. Just to look at uh, some images of some of the things I'm talking about. This is uh, the cover of the first edition of Stanley Ryerson's book. And his other famous book. He, he had published a number of uh, uh, books, but these are the ones that are often used in our studies of the national question. This is an interesting book. If you ever see this, Roots of Oppression, published uh, by the American Communist Party Publishing House. Uh, <clears throat> the American Indian Question by Steve Talbot, who was a, an American Marxist writing in the early 1970s. This was a pamphlet that we published at the time of the uh, uh, Trudeau government's white paper in 1969, uh, a reply to Ottawa's new Indian policy by Ben Swankey, who was a prominent uh, writer for our party during that period of time. Uh, quite a, a fascinating pamphlet, really dissecting the, uh, that attempt at assimilation. This is uh, an update of uh, Rolf Knight's work expanded from the original. If you ever see that, it's well worth buying. You can see it in a secondhand store. I couldn't uh, upload a picture of the uh, Homer Stevens book, A Life in Fishing, uh, but this is Homer. We'll talk a bit more about him later, I think. You know, One and a Half Men, this is a book by Murray Dobbin. Uh, story of Jim Brady and Malcolm Norris, Métis Patriots of the 20th century. If you ever see that, please get it. I'll pay you for uh, your expenses if you don't want it yourself. Here is Jim as a, a young man during the, uh, uh, the 1940s and later in life. He's a real icon of ours on the prairies. This is the Métis Famous Five of the 1930s, Pete Tompkins, Felix Calu, Malcolm Norris, Joe Dion, and Jim Brady. Uh, in a 1960 interview, Brady said his politics were based on the idea that what we would refer to vaguely as the national liberation of the Indian peoples and the Métis people in Canada cannot be completed until Canada as a whole and the Western world as a whole free themselves of that vicious system which has imposed these conditions on a conquered people. Uh, Brady openly supported solidarity with the white working class against colonial capitalism, which is uh, what he uh, considered to be that vicious system. Another example was Homer Stevens, the longtime leader of the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union. Homer's grandmother was from the Cowichan First Nation on Vancouver Island. He was widely respected in indigenous communities along the coast. He strongly promoted united action between the UFAWU and the Native Brotherhood, which represented most fishermen from these communities. And that's a, a long and fascinating story in itself. Uh, just a bit about development of our positions. The party's 1943 convention adopted a resolution of full support for the Métis and Indian people in their struggle for full equality with other citizens of Canada. Well, uh, many of them didn't consider themselves citizens of Canada. Uh, but that reflects the terminology of the day uh, and records its sympathy for the democratic reforms as put before the authorities by the organizations of the Métis and Indian peoples. In 1959, we issued a statement condemning the RCMP raid against the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy. The statement demanded the recognition by statute of the identity of the Indians as a people with the full right of self-government on their lands, including control of property and civil rights, 
finances, welfare services, education, and cultural development, in short, of their fundamental right to determine their own way of life, including their association as Indians, which is important because the Indian Act has always been used to determine who is uh, an Indian and who is not in this country. So we became the first political party to explicitly declare support for the principle of indigenous self-government and self-determination. Uh, during the late 1960s, uh, many developments began to speed up the red power movement, which uh, was associated with an explicitly anti-capitalist anti and revolutionary vision. Uh, our newspapers were full of uh, reports about the fight against the white paper, the founding of the American Indian movement, the occupation of Wounded Knee, the arrest and deportation from Canada of Leonard Peltier and, and much more. Uh, our election platforms uh, at that time and since have also uh, publicized our positions to millions of people. Uh, our materials have been circulated at all kinds of events over the years attended by Indigenous activists. During my time in Saskatchewan in the 80s, these included the World Congress of Indigenous Peoples in 1983, which uh, helped start the process towards the adoption of the UNDRIP by the United Nations. Celebrations of the 100th anniversary of the uh, 1885 Northwest Resistance. And since then, of course, we've been involved in solidarity with many, many other struggles. The Oka summer of 1990, uh, the protests against the RCMP attacks on the Tsipetan defenders at Gustafson Lake here in BC and in Ontario against the police shooting of Dudley George, uh, solidarity with the indigenous uh, fishing rights struggles in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, the Caledonia land dispute, uh, uh, the escalation of the Six Nations of the Grand River uh, efforts to defend their historic treaty rights, uh, the Idle No More movement, uh, the resistance by Wet'suwet'en land defenders and their allies against the uh, corporate and government-backed pipelines uh, leading to highway blockades across the country uh, a couple of years back. Um, the updated program of our party, and uh, this will bring me to the end of the first part of what I'm saying here, uh, says the record of Canadian history continues to the present day in the form of assimilationist proposals for permanent elimination of inherent national rights, opening up reserve lands for private sale and gradual absorption of indigenous peoples into the broader population, all in contravention of internationally recognized rights such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In this very real sense, the policies of colonialism driven by and serving the interests of ruling circles in the European centers uh, and working to benefit Canada's own bourgeoisie are at the heart of the foundation of the Canadian state and remain in place in the 21st century. The original treaty signed by Indigenous peoples have been constantly violated. The unceded traditional territories uh, of those who never surrendered or signed treaties have been turned into crown land for the profits of the big resource monopolies. So that says a little bit about our analysis. Uh, now I wanna turn just briefly to the question of settler colonialism, which is one of the uh, most frequently asked questions we get. Uh, there are many international struggles that have significant parallels with indigenous re resistance here in Canada. Uh, people often mention the Palestinian people's struggle against Israeli occupation, uh, and the black majority of South Africa against apartheid. And each case revolves largely around the imperialist tactic of using settlers to seize the lands of the original inhabitants. Uh, both the Zionists and the apartheid rulers in South Africa studied Canada's genocidal policies. So there's obvious reasons for activists to characterize Canada as a settler colonial state. And we understand uh, the reasons for that. 
However, in our view, there's a difference between a particular set of strategies used by imperialist ruling classes uh, to expand their sphere of profiteering and exploitation uh, and the fundamental class nature of societies. We view settler colonial, colonialism as one form of capitalist expansion, but at the economic level, all these societies are fundamentally based on capitalist exploitation of a mainly working class population. So we need to take account of demographic and historical factors in developing a revolutionary strategy. In South Africa, for example, the overwhelming majority of the exploited working class were black or from the so-called colored or Asian communities, less than 10% were white and the majority of those had relatively privileged positions. So no serious struggle of any kind was possible unless it was mostly based uh, in the black working class, which had uh, easily a large enough and politically conscious enough size to use a combination of strikes, mass community uprisings, sabotage, armed struggle to cripple the apartheid state and eventually force an end to white rule. But even in that situation, these movements never characterized the revolution as a struggle between blacks and whites. Uh, Nelson Mandela and most of the other jailed leaders of the ANC and Mukonto Wasizwe uh, always understood the importance of gaining even small numbers of white comrades and allies. In Canada, the demographic reality is that indigenous peoples comprise about 6% of the population. In many cases, they're in good positions to affect corporate interests and profits, at least temporarily, such as blockades of railway lines, highways, ports, actions against pipelines or forestry operations. Uh, but it's hard to see how a political strategy relying on militant actions by a small part of the population could successfully end capitalism. However, most indigenous people are low income and working class in economic terms. They do have common interests with millions of other working class people. So a socialist strategy that succeeds will necessarily require unity of indigenous and non-indigenous workers against our common capitalist enemy. But that in itself requires a much higher level of anti-racist awareness among the non-indigenous working class and understanding that the same corporate interests which drive the resource extraction and export economy at the expense of indigenous peoples also squeeze profits out of the entire working class. The extent to which some people of European origins in this country still cling to the racist white man's country narrative remains a major obstacle to working class unity. That makes this obviously a, a complicated and difficult project. But as Marxists, we know that material factors are on our side in the long run. It's the basic fundamental interest of non-Indigenous workers to go beyond easy, glib, anti-racist phrases and to learn how to extend meaningful solidarity to Indigenous peoples and their allies whenever they stand up against the destructive attacks by big capital. It's a long-standing revolutionary concept that no nation can liberate itself while it oppresses another. And that's just as true for the working class of this country as anywhere else. So I'm gonna wrap up on that thought and turn it over to Tyson, your turn comment. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for that, Kimball. Um, and I just, I didn't introduce myself earlier, so I'll just quickly uh, say that yes, uh, my name is Tyson. Kimball mentioned I'm the Vancouver Island organizer. Uh, my own family background is also a mix of, of Métis and uh, Slavic settlers on the prairies. Um, and uh, well, a lot of Kimball's uh, presentation was on specifically the Canadian uh, context. Uh, I'm hoping that I can situate uh, the situation in Canada in, in light of the long history of, of anti-colonial struggles by Marxists and non-Marxists. Kimball mentioned the um, importance of the anti-colonial struggles to Marx and Engels and Lenin. I'm gonna expand somewhat on that. And I'm also going to 
uh, discuss some of the other uh, significant anti-colonial revolutionaries uh, briefly, like M. N. Roy and George Padmore, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, before coming back to Canada and also touching on the contentious settler colonialism myself. So, of course, starting with Lenin. Uh, can I get this out of here? Okay, so a really important work is Lenin's Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, which he published in 1916, largely in response to the outbreak of World War I, a decision by European Social Democrats to side with their own national bourgeoisies and colonial empires of Europe, uh, which were at that time fighting to redivide the world and increase their share in the profits. That said, Lenin's admiration for the independent struggles, as we mentioned, uh, you know, he, he observed uh, in the colonies in China, Iran, Turkey, the Dutch East Indies, and, and elsewhere. And uh, the importance that he placed on global unity between the advanced workers of Europe and the peasantry in the maldeveloped countries, the right of self-determination for colonized peoples were all absolutely central to Lenin's political understanding long before 1916, and of course, the October Revolution the following year. Much of Lenin's understanding is, of course, owed to Marx. Lenin would quote Marx repeatedly in his book on imperialism, observing events in India, then under British domination. Uh, Marx in 15, 1853 had been the very first European philosopher to set colonial emancipation, not simply colonial reform, as an objective of the European socialist movement. And still more, to look forward to a national liberation movement that might even precede the emancipation of the European working class. And such insight and vision could belong to Marx alone. Marx made a clear connection between the struggles for national liberation of oppressed peoples with the global movement for socialism, uh, as well as making similar observations regarding the potential consequences of the Taiping rebellion in China for the ruling classes of the advanced capitalist country. The importance of global class unity for Marx and for Engels was vital not only to those suffering the colonies, but to the workers in the imperialist countries themselves, with Marx clearly identifying the belief held by members of the so-called ruling nation in their stake in the conquests of their own bourgeoisie as the primary inhibitor to class consciousness. Indeed, uh, case studies uh, such as the, those of the British Empire in India clearly disproved the notion that English workers or even English society as a whole benefited from the colonial relationship. In fact, they paid far more in the cost of maintaining the empire than was ever gained and providing the soldiers who would be killed in foreign lands fighting for the profits of the ruling class, that being the English capitalists. And this is because imperialism, while it operates as a distinctly transnational form of capital accumulation and exploitation, as Kimball said, ultimately needs to be understood through class analysis. Now, in his writings on the US Civil War in the 1860s, Marx made many vital connections between race and class and Marx's most sustained involvement with the labor and revolutionary movements occurred during this heightened period of resistance to national oppression, racism and slavery, thus playing a fundamental role in Marx's political thought. Marx gives an important example, which Lenin references in his own writing in Imperialism, stating that the ordinary work English worker hates the Irish worker as a competitor who lowers his standard of life. In relation to the Irish worker, he regards himself as a member of the ruling nation, and consequently he becomes a tool of the English aristocrats and capitalists against Ireland, thus strengthening their domination over himself. His attitude towards him is much the same as that of the poor whites to the Negroes in the former slave states of the USA. The Irishman sees in the English worker both the accomplice and the stupid tool of the English rulers in Ireland. This antagonism is the secret of the impotence of the English working class, despite its organization. It is the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power. And it's this concept which lies at the root of Marx's internationalism, that the working class and all oppressed peoples have more to gain through united resistance to capitalist and imperialist domination and everything to lose from the false belief 
that they in fact benefit from oppressing and enslaving other nations and peoples. In Marx's own words, a nation that enslaves another forges its own chains. So by the time Marx idea, Marx's ideas had developed most thoroughly, he and Engels spoke admirably of the many communal modes of production which they had studied from the Incas, India to Indonesia to the Iroquois and much more. The respect for gender equality and the role played by women in these societies was also noted. From the 1850s until the end of his life, Marx frequently referred to, quote, the inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization, being one of few, if any, European scholars to reverse the common ethnocentric distinction between so-called superior and inferior peoples, placing the Europeans as the barbarians. In Lenin's own observations, particularly studying the Russian Empire, where Russian settlers were used as a tool of colonial expansion into the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Siberia, where the Russian language and Russian Orthodox Church were given preferential treatment, Lenin saw that while the benefactors of Tsarist imperialism included ethnic Russian nobles, and to a lesser extent, the yet relatively small Russian capitalist class, they also included European investors from England, France, and elsewhere. Additionally, local exploiters from the colonized regions also carved out a beneficial, uh, a beneficial arrangement as compradors. The vast majority of the Russian nation, however, the peasantry, the industrial proletariat, the conscripts in the Tsar's armies, they had every reason to side with the oppressed peoples. They did not benefit from colonial exploitation, even if they were less oppressed in certain ways. Being less oppressed is not the equivalent of being the oppressor. This is completely distinct from the conclusions reached by the European Social Democrats who came to believe in an above class interest common to the entire German nation, to all Englishmen, etc. Explaining Lenin's theory, Stalin would write that Lenin, Leninism laid bare this crying incongruity, broke down the wall between whites and blacks, between European and Asiatics, between the civilized and uncivilized slaves of imperialism, and thus linked the national question with the question of the colonies. The national question was thereby transformed from a particular and internal state problem into a general and international problem, into a world problem of emancipating the oppressed peoples in the dependent countries and colonies from the yoke of imperialism. Lenin indicated that a socialist revolution for proletarian emancipation will not be solely or chiefly a struggle of the revolutionary proletarians in each country against their bourgeoisie. No, it will be a struggle of all the imperialist oppressed colonies and countries of all dependent countries against uh, international imperialism. The civil war of the working people combined with national wars against international imperialism. And Lenin's understanding of the way imperialism operated would form the basis throughout the 20th century for Marxist-Leninists, as well as many non-communists fighting for national liberation and anti-colonial revolutions. For example, the Indian revolutionary M. N. Roy argued at the common turn in the 1920s that the colonies represented one of the most vital sources of stability and strength of contemporary capitalism. That the European working class will not succeed in overthrowing capitalism until this source is stopped up. And that only the end of colonialism could bring down capitalism in the West. Uh, Roy would become a professor in the USSR at the Communist University for Toilers of the East, where countless revolutionaries from Africa, Asia, and elsewhere would study, and which laid down the groundwork for what would become Pan-Africanism. The Trinidadian Pan-Africanist, George Padmore, was one among many revolutionary students who studied here. And he similarly argued that members of the working classes must be deceived into believing that they share in the benefits of the colonial or explicitly fascist project, when in fact, white and black workers alike have a common enemy in capitalism, whatever its form, and that race prejudice and white chauvinism are among the chief weapons of the capitalist class and their agents of all colors, encouraging workers to hate each other precisely to prevent them from uniting. It is no coincidence that white supremacist organizations like the KKK had an equal hatred for communists as they did for blacks. Admore observed in great detail how black workers in the United States, and especially in the colonies, 
were used to lower the wages and standards of living for white workers by acting as a hyper-exploited segment of the working class. He further noted with contempt local traders like the Senegalese Comprador Blaise Diagne, who sold out his people in alliance with imperialism for a few extra coins, rallying colonial troops to support French imperialism in Europe and abroad. Admore was an important influence on Kwame Nkrumah, the revolutionary leader, first president of Ghana, another incredibly important anti-imperialist who saw the importance of broad anti-colonial unity uh, on the one hand for all of Africa, despite its national differences, but additionally with the global proletariat, all of which he discusses in his book, Neocolonialism, the Highest Stage of Imperialism, which is a direct reference to Lenin's own work. This is precisely because capitalism and imperialism are global systems and cannot be fought on a strictly local level. Another famous Pan-African scholar and af activist, the Guyanese Walter Rodney, similarly explains that the Germans in the Third Reich were encouraged to believe their standard of living would improve by subjugating peoples of other races, just as whites of all classes in South Africa were convinced that their well-being was dependent on white supremacy. Of course, in both cases, this is demonstrably false. So returning to Canada today, is Canada a fundamentally unique situation? Like South Africa, like Australia, there is a history of colonialism in which settlers were used as tools of expansion westwards, as Kimball mentioned, in a process of dispossession of indigenous lands. Members of the ruling Anglo-Canadian nation are today still led to believe that they benefit from the imperialist relationship. And we can see this in countless examples. When Justin Trudeau announced that the Kinder Morgan pipeline was in the national interest, he was articulating precisely the same above class theory of common interest professed by all the imperialist powers throughout previous centuries. But do these pipeline projects benefit the entire Anglo-Canadian nation? They absolutely do not. Do they benefit First Nations? No, you bet they don't. However, they certainly benefit the disproportionately white Canadian ruling classes, not to mention an extremely small handful of Indigenous Comprados. How frequently we see the poorest segments of the working class spit the most vile, racist, and xenophobic remarks, even if they're living in abject poverty. Are they benefiting from the imperialist relationship? Even if they've never owned even the tiniest plot of land, nothing whatsoever to lose, they're convinced that decolonization, that returning control of the land to Indigenous peoples is something targeting their already miserable quality of life in many cases. Despite the rhetoric of the far right, working class people of settler descent clearly have nothing to lose and everything to gain from allying with oppressed Indigenous and racialized peoples from all nations. As Marx said, it's worth repeating, it is this antagonism which is the secret of the impotence of the working class. It is this secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power. But it isn't just the far right which objectively upholds this division. A favorite word of the ultra left these days to describe the situation in Canada is not imperialism, but the contentious settler colonialism. They'll refer to themselves as, contrite, as a contrite settler and uh, voice these sentiments of white guilt as though they've personally exploited indigenous peoples in this country. And in some cases, maybe they have. However, I think we need to think very deeply and ask ourselves what is implied by this term and how it differs from imperialism. As Lenin would do, we need to follow it to its logical conclusions. I know Marxists, Radlibs, and anarchists who all use this term well, I don't believe they all mean exactly the same thing, and it's because this term is vaguely defined. But in the words of Michael Parenti, the power of a label is in its left being undefined. Uh, sorry, being left undefined. As this precludes any rational examination of its political content. Now to me, especially considering its use among anarchists and the ultra left, I think what is frequently implied by this term is that the primary contradiction is not one in which the ruling classes are pitted against the working class and oppressed nations as Marx, Lenin, Roy, Padmore, and countless other anti-colonial and anti-racist revolutionaries demonstrated, but represents a narrow nationalism in which anyone who is deemed to be a settler, a member of the ruling nation, shares a common above-class interest with the ruling classes of that nation. That is to say, 
that the primary contradiction is between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. The conclusions to be drawn from such a view, I believe are extremely reactionary and even dangerous. If what benefits indigenous peoples is truly in conflict with what benefits the so-called settler, what is to prevent such individuals, especially if they're already in dire economic straits, from becoming a fascist, from becoming a white supremacist? Shall we tell the most oppressed and downtrodden worker that because they are not indigenous, they are an exploiter who must make sacrifices to their already miserable standard of living? This isn't what I believe. It's not what the Communist Party believes. The ultra left is by this means objectively pushing working class people exploited by capitalism into the hands of the most reactionary elements like the PPC. In conclusion, comrades, I believe very strongly that we must be clear in offering a revolutionary anti-imperialist alternative, which is based on decolonization, on the principle of national self-determination and on the unity between all working people, indigenous and non-indigenous alike, in the construction of a social society which is free from exploitation and oppression. And I will conclude. Thanks, comrades.